Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, uh, I guess, uh, present this project on behalf of the community of practice in MIS. Um, so I don't have any disclosures. In terms of the learning objectives, the first is to uh, examine the diagnostic performance of preoperative biopsies in predicting high-grade endometrial cancer at eight Canadian centers. And then we also want to compare uh, general uh, pathologists to gynecologic pathologists in terms of um, the ability to uh, predict high-grade on preoperative biopsies. And finally, to consider the implications of this project on uh, clinical practice. So as we know, endometrial cancers um, are the most commonly diagnosed gynecologic malignancy in high-income countries. And although high-grade cancers only account for 20% of the cases, there is a disproportionate um, mortality and recurrence rate associated with them. And preoperative biopsies play a crucial role in surgical planning. So um, across all the eight um, centers that we um, worked with, um, surgeons did feel that a high-grade diagnosis will change their surgical management in terms of staging. So whether staging looks like, um, or whether they use sentinel lymph node biopsy or full staging, that's uh, clinician dependent, but the fact that they will change their management depending on the preoperative biopsy uh, was consistent across all sites. Um, so there have been other studies that have looked at this in the past. Um, so I'm going to go over three that um, uh, had a similar sort of uh, obje objective. Um, but one of the things to highlight was that these are all retrospective uh, studies. Um, they looked at um, all endometrial biopsies that were done within a certain time frame, and they looked to see how well they predicted uh, the final uh, diagnosis, whether that be high grade or low grade. Um, and they also um, were single center experiences. So the first one was Huang et al. Um, they had a sample size of 360 patients, uh, 139 of which were high grade, and they found that 86% um, uh, of high grade endometrial cancers had uh, the preoperative biopsy was concordant with the final diagnosis. And Goxadef et al. Um, had a sample size of 335, and they had 46 high-grade cases, and they found that there was an 88% accuracy rate in terms of uh, pre-op biopsy and um, how well it predicted final diagnosis. And finally, Helpman et al. Um, looked at a sample size of 653, 306 of which were uh, high-grade, and they found that the preoperative biopsy is a mod modest predictor of surgical patho pathology features. So in terms of the limitations of these studies, uh, we find that they had a relatively small sample of high-grade endometrial cancers, and they tended to be single-center experiences. And we also um, wanted to sort of work backwards. So we wanted to look at all the high-grade endometrial cases within a certain time period and then move backwards to see how effective the pre-op biopsy was at predicting um, the final diagnosis. So we're, uh, we looked at it from a slightly different perspective than these studies. Um, so that was the first piece of our project, and the second piece was looking at um, who interprets these biopsies. So in majority of the cases, a gynecologic pathologist um, interprets these biopsies, or they review the biopsy that was initially interpreted by a general pathologist. And in a minority of cases, a general pathologist is the only um, individual that interprets these biopsies. Um, so again, to reiterate the study objective, um, First, we wanted to evaluate the diagnostic performance of pre-op biopsies in predicting final diagnosis. And the secondary objective was to evaluate the performance of general pathologists compared to gynae pathologists in predicting final grade uh, or uh, final diagnosis. So we did a retrospective cohort study uh, looking at all uh, patients who had a hysterectomy by a gynecologic oncologist between 2012 and 2016, and they must have had a final diagnosis of high-grade endometrial cancer on final pathology. And we recruited from eight Canadian centers that are listed here. Um, in terms of data collection, we looked at baseline patient characteristics, the preoperative biopsy, so the grade and histotype, and who it was read by, um, and the hysterectomy specimen, so grade, histotype, uh, the type of um, staging procedure, and the final stage itself. Um, Analysis-wise, we looked at, again at the overall pre-op um, high-grade endometrial cancer identification rate, um, and, as well as between uh, the gyne general pathology group versus the gynae pathology group, and then we did Fisher's exact test and univariate logistic regression for analysis purposes. Um, so we had a total sample size of 1,237 patients. The average age was 67 years, um, and we had good representation from all the sites that we uh, recruited from. And looking at, again, um, this data. So we had 1,197 patients who had an interpretable preoperative biopsy, and you can see that about three fourths uh, of the three fourths of these patients um, were either initially interpreted by a gynae pathologist or were reviewed by a gynae pathologist, and a smaller proportion, so about one fourth, uh, were only interpreted by a general pathologist and were not reviewed. Um, and so when we look at the overall discordancy rate between preoperative um, 
grade um, and post-op diagnosis, it was 15%. So because we only looked at high grade cancers on final diagnosis, this meant that 15% of our patients um, were diagnosed as low grade on pre-op biopsy. And of these 15%, a majority were grade two endometrioid endometrial ca uh, cancers. And then now looking at um, patients who were only read by a general pathologist, the discordancy was 32%. And those who were either uh, interpreted by a gynae pathologist or reviewed by a gynae pathologist, the discordancy was 13%. Um, so compared to general pathologists, gynae pathologists were 3.24 times more likely to die diagnose um, high-grade endometrial cancer on preoperative biopsy. Um, and now looking at the patients who were diagnosed as pre, uh, low-grade on pre-op, we just looked to see what they were up upgraded to postoperatively. Um, so majority of the patients, so 73% were grade 3 endometrioid, 11% were serous, 7% uh, uh, triple MT, and 8% were mixed histology. Um, and so this table looks at sort of who um, did the preoperative interpretation and how that impacted the staging procedure. Um, so if so, we can see that full staging was not ex excessively high in both groups. But if you're read by a gynae pathologist or reviewed by a gynae pathologist, you're more likely to have full staging as opposed to only being interpreted by a general pathologist. Whereas on the flip side, if you're only interpreted by the biopsy was only interpreted by a general pathologist, you're more likely to have any sort of pelvic staging, whether this be a pelvic lymphadenectomy or a central node biopsy, compared to the gynae pathology group. Um, and then now looking at this data from a different perspective, so if you had um, a pre-op diagnosis of high-grade endometrial cancer, uh, you were more likely to have full staging, whereas if you had a preoperative diagnosis of low-grade endometrial cancer, you're more likely to have any sort of pelvic staging or no staging at all. So um, that's sort of just kind of what the uh, data shows there. Um, but interestingly, um, regardless of whether you were low-grade or high-grade on uh, preop uh, biopsy, the stage, it, uh, there was no association with the final stage of the cancer. So in terms of the study, it was a successful effort by various Canadian centers to generate a large um, database of high-grade endometrial um, cancers that can also be used for future studies. And we found that um, gynae pathologists were more likely to identify high-grade endometrial cancers on preoperative biopsies compared to general pathologists. But that being said, there's still um, a a relatively large level of discordancy um, in terms of preoperative biopsies and how effectively they diagnose um, uh, post-op diagnosis or how effectively they predict post-op diagnosis. And even within the gynae pathology group, we saw a 14% discordancy rate. Um, so this brings up the question of whether it's difficult to accurately base surgical staging procedures for high-grade endometrial cancer on preoperative biopsy results alone. Um, so in terms of our next steps, uh, we want to review the discordant cases to identify the reasons for why this happened, and this will be in collaboration with uh, pathologists. And we also think that there might be some value to having a unified or a standard Canadian approach to um, interpreting biopsies. So whether this means uh, immunohistochemical studies for all biopsies, or maybe moving away from directing um, staging uh, based on pre-op biopsy alone. And the final thing, uh, or the final um, uh, aspect to consider is the financial and resource burden of having a general pathologist read an endometrial biopsy followed by a gynae pathologist reviewing it. Um, so one of the things that um, to consider is should gynae pathologists read all endometrial biopsies given the large level of discrepancy between um, how effectively gynae pathologists are able to um, predict uh, final diagnosis versus general pathologists. Um, and uh, the other thing that I mentioned earlier was that a majority of the Patients who were diagnosed as uh, diagnosed as low grade um, preoperatively tended to be grade two endometrioid uh, endometrial cancers. So should only those be um, reviewed by a, a gynae pathologist? So those are some things are uh, to consider, um, you know, when, when looking at the results of the study. And um, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, and I will say that um, excellent uh, presentation. You did very very well. Um, I have uh, one question, and I see that Mark has from the floor. Um, can you comment on the um, discrepancy on the cases that have been um, established center to center? Because you have a, a wide range at some centers that was probably captured, seems like, most of the cases, and others only a small percentage of the cases. Um, and then did you consider doing comparison center to center within the pathology divisions to see if there's discrepancies or changes center to center? Mm 
Um, so that's something that we're considering for like future steps um, to look at the differences between centers and also kind of collaborating with the pathology departments in various centers to kind of look at why the discrepancies or <coughs> the discordancies were there. Um, but uh, thanks for the suggestion and I think we'll consider that for um, our next steps. Mark. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Um, yeah, the, this is really timely in our system where we strive in Canada to make sure that the patient gets their surgery done at the right place by the right person. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a role for molecular testing in your algorithm in some way to triage patients better? Um, so that's, again, something that um, we would have to go back to see which patients did have like um, immunohistochemical or molecular um, testing and then kind of seeing how that impacts, um, I guess, the ability to predict um, high-grade endometrial cancer. So that's something that I guess we could look into um, and um, <coughs> consider for the future. Thank you. Okay, great. So uh, thank you very much to the program committee for allowing us to present this research today. I'm actually presenting this on behalf of one of our residents, Dr. Brenna Swift, who unfortunately could not be here today, but fortunately because she had a baby girl on Tuesday. So I think that's a good reason. Um, so, but this is totally representative of all her hard work. So um, uh, I just forward the slides here. Yeah, great. Okay. So I have no uh, uh, disclosures. So in terms of lymphadenectomy, there is a long-standing debate about the diagnostic role or therapeutic role of lymphadenectomy. And I think um, diagnostic role is less controversial um, because we know that we use lymphadenectomy to determine stage and then help to guide adjuvant treatment, whether it's adjuvant chemotherapy or radiation. Um, in terms, and we are definitely moving that way with sentinel lymph node mapping as used as a diagnostic role of assessing the lymph nodes. Um, however, with more movement towards sentinel lymph node mapping, is there a potential therapeutic role that we may be losing um, by doing, concentrating more on the diagnostic uh, aspects of lymphadenectomy? And um, also one needs to consider along with that, is there the rate of complications that could potentially occur with lymphadenectomy, whether it be injury to vessels or nerves, lymphedema, or any thrombosis thereafter? In terms of previous studies that have looked at the di uh, sorry at the therapeutic role of lymphadenectomy, it's hard to dif or hard to discern um, because many of those studies have both low grade and high risk histology combined together, and most of those patients are going to be low risk, and therefore um, we know that the rate of lymph node metastasis is very different in those uh, two different uh, subtypes. So our study objective was to uh, evaluate whether lymphadenectomy and high-risk endometrial cancer impacts lymph node recurrence by evaluating variables associated with nodal recurrence, assess the location of recurrence after lymphadenectomy, and also determine if the number of lymph nodes removed affects recurrence. This is a retrospective cohort study. We used uh, data from the Shrek database, which is the Canadian High-Risk Endometrial Consortium. Many centers in this room con contributed to this database, but we pulled out the high-risk endometrial cancers at two tertiary care centers in Toronto. Inclusion criteria were high-risk um, histotypes such as uh, grade 3 endometrioid, serous clear cell carcinosarcoma um, between 2000 and 2010, and follow-up was until 2018. And our exclusion criteria were those lost to follow-up, those with post-operative death, those with persistent or progressive disease, and patients treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. For statistical analysis, there was descriptive statistics as well as survival analysis for recurrences. Kaplan-Meier curves were compared by a log rank test, and then multivariate analysis was used, um, done using a Cox proportional hazards model. So in terms of our patients, the total number of patients was 714. After applying the exclusion criteria, there was 570 patients, of which 205 had a, a recurrence. And among those, the, um, there was 167 which had a known document, documented location of recurrence. 98 of these, and this was the study population, the 167. So 98 of these patients had a lymph node recurrence. Uh, 69 had no lymph node recurrence. Out of those 98, there were 68 patients who had both a lymph node recurrence and somewhere else, but we classified that as lymph node recurrence. In this uh, table, we compared both uh, demographic and treatment variables of those who had a nodal recurrence versus those who did not. So we compared or looked at age, 
histology, mode of surgery, whether it was MIS or open, uh, type of hysterectomy, um, and a stage a and adjuvant treatment. And here you can see that those with stage three uh, disease, where there was a higher proportion with nodal recurrence, and also there was a higher proportion with adjuvant chemotherapy who had nodal recurrence. And then we looked at to see whether people had a pelvic lymph node dissection, periodic lymph node dissection, if they had positive lymph nodes, and then the number of pelvic lymph nodes removed. And basically, you could see that those with positive pelvic lymph nodes, there was a higher proportion here who had a nodal recurrence. And when we looked at overall nodal status, so that could be people who had positive pelvic nodes or positive periodic nodes, there was a higher nodal recurrence. So for our study population, the median uh, follow-up time was about 24 months. Medium time to recurrence was 13.6 months. And then for the 98 patients who had a lymph node recurrence, it was a median time to nodal recurrence of 14 months. Here we stratified uh, the nodal recurrence-free survival based on the status of the lymph nodes. You can see that those who had positive lymph nodes are in red. Those with negative lymph nodes are in blue, and those who had no lymphadenectomy or lymph node status was unknown, was in purple. And you can see that um, at 12, 24, and at 60 months, the uh, nodal recurrence-free survival was the lowest in those with positive pelvic lymph nodes. On our multivariate analysis, the only independent predictor of nodal recurrence was nodal status, having a positive um, node. The hazard ratio was 4.0, and this was statistically significant. The other clinical factors that we evaluated um, were not statistically significant. On this slide, or this table, it's a bit busy, but uh, essentially what we were doing was evaluating the location of the lymph node recurrence and comparing that to where the positive lymph node was found at staging. And essentially, this top half of the table shows that recurrence happened on the same side as where that positive lymph node at staging was found. But um, in 43% of patients, it occurred on the opposite side. So basically, um, this is demonstrating that it's not necessarily the ipsilateral side that will recur. Next, we evaluated the number of lymph nodes removed and its effect on recurrence. So there was 334 patients who had a lymphadenectomy. Um, 74 had at least one positive lymph node at the time of staging. And then we categorized the patients based on the number of lymph nodes removed at the surgical staging. So it was categorized as less than five lymph nodes, five to 15 lymph nodes, or more than 15 lymph nodes removed. Median follow-up time was about um, 29 months, and median time to recurrence was 13.7 uh, months. So on this, we stratified recurrence-free survival by the number of lymph nodes removed. You can see that those who had less than five lymph nodes removed are in blue. Those who had five to 15 lymph nodes removed, it was in red, and more than 15 lymph nodes removed is in purple. And then essentially, when we look, at 12 months, the recurrence-free survival rate was approximately equal amongst the three groups, approximately 78%. But then when you go out to 36 months and to 60 months, um, there was a statistically significant higher recurrence-free survival in those with more than 15 lymph nodes removed uh, with a hazard ratio of 0 0.5. And the median recurrence-free survival in months was 87 months. This was a univariate analysis, however, and not controlled by other factors. So limitations of the study, it is a retrospective cohort study with a proportion loss to follow-up because of treatment or uh, observation or surveillance closer to home. Um, the location of the positive lymph nodes may have been limited by OR documentation about exact nodal bundles which were removed, and also in terms of number of lymph nodes removed, sometimes it was difficult to discern whether it was complete lymphadenectomy versus debulking of uh, specific nodes. So in conclusion, uh, positive lymph nodes at surgical staging was an independent predictor of nodal recurrence in high-risk endometrial cancers. We found that when there is more than one, at least one positive lymph node at surgical staging, the greater number of lymph nodes removed was associated with increased recurrence-free survival. Our current method of lymphadenectomy is diagnostic, but there may be a therapeutic role if an extensive node dissection is completed, perhaps to remove uh, any other remaining uh, positive lymph nodes.
So in future directions, a more precise technique of identifying metastatic lymph nodes could potentially provide a therapeutic benefit without morbidity of a full lymphadenectomy. So these are all the people that were involved in this study, and um, thank you very much for your attention. I'll take any questions. Hey, nice study. Um, I think we have to be cautious, though, because it's a univariate analysis, and yes. the piece that we don't have here is what adjuvant treatment do these patients get? And I think certainly if we think about um, the bigger lymphadenectomies, there's probably an historical aspect to that as well in terms of these being done at an earlier time when maybe we were more want to give adjuvant treatment like uh, pelvic radiotherapy versus valbrachy, and hard to know how chemo mm -hmm. factors into that. Absolutely. I did point, I, it is important to point out that curve about the number of lymph nodes removed. That was purely a univariate analysis. The next steps would be to control for those types of factors. Thanks. That was, that was great. I guess my only comment on the number of lymph nodes involved, and I don't know if you looked at it in this study or, or have similar issues. You know, you can do dissections in the same amount of place, and sometimes it's two nodes and sometimes it's 30, mm -hmm. and it depends on who's on that day. So I don't know if you had looked at that or whether you guys have a standardized protocol for it. No, I mean, it's impossible to kind of tease out that type of information and limitations of the study. So I guess this is more of a question for um, others, but there are lots of cases out there where people, particularly on the learning curve for sentinel lymph nodes, were doing sentinel lymph nodes and then following it with the traditional nodal, nodal dissection. Presumably, you could get the answer to your question as to whether it's therapeutic in understanding if those patients with positive sentinel nodes and then the full dissection, no other nodes did as poorly or as well. That's true. Um, if we have that, I mean, there's, it depends on what studies are going on at the time in terms of sentinel lymph nodes and whether a full lymph node dissection is completed at the same time. I think many people are moving towards sentinel lymph nodes only, may not have all that information. Well, but I was going to say true, but uh, at least early on, a lot of people were doing the sentinels and then doing the node dissection, so right. the data must exist out there. Well, you, one could take a look. It's also, um, you know, tricky because a lot of times the sentinel lymph node will be negative, so then if it, you would want to see if it's positive and then see what the correlation is with the other lymph nodes in that area. Okay. Um, you have a question or are you swatting something? Okay. Okay. Is there any uh, comparison of other disease sites with this hypothesis? Melanoma, vulva, breast? The question is whether there's other disease sites that is testing this hypothesis. Or there's some background In terms of the therapeutic uh, evaluation, I think, um, you know, for melanoma, for breast, it, it's been pretty established that a central lymph node is... Sorry, yeah. In terms of um, uh, for breast and melanoma, it tends to be sentinel lymph nodes has been validated and has not had an impact necessarily on, um, on the survival. Um, but uh, as Marcus was just pointing out, for say germ cell tumors in the male population, um, you know, there is a therapeutic benefit for a complete nodal dissection in those uh, patients. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be somewhat provocative here, and I'll say that um, for any of us who have operated with some of the urologic oncologists and see the way they do lymph node dissections, uh, we're honest with ourselves, our lymph node dissections are not complete lymph node dissections. And I think the question about whether it's therapeutic or diagnostic still eludes us, frankly. I do think there probably is a subset of patients in their recurrence where it can be therapeutic if we knew where to be targeting our initial dissection, because right now it, it's still somewhat crude, I think. So I think we don't have the answer in part because we haven't been able to have a, a good way of identifying metastatic lymph nodes. The sentinel lymph nodes, I think, is very helpful for a diagnostic technique. There's no question. I think it replaces a full dissection. If there is any kind of therapeutic um, element to what we do from a lymphadenectomy, there probably is some more work to be done to identify uh, metastatic lymph nodes. Okay, so thank you to the committee for allowing me to speak today, and thank you for that fantastic setup, everybody. That's perfect. So I have no conflict of interest to disclose, and I am not, um, not discussing any off-label use of medications in my presentation. 
So here are our learning objectives. So as we all know, endometrial cancer is the most common gynecologic malignancy in Canadian women, affecting about 3% of our population. And as we've just talked about, the diagnosis of lymph node metastases is important for prognostication and also for determining who requires adjuvant therapy. And furthermore, there is retrospective data to suggest that there may be a therapeutic benefit to lymph node dissection. However, full routine lymphadenectomy is still controversial. Unfortunately, currently our non-invasive methods to diagnose lymph node metastases such as functional or morphologic imaging do not have the required sensitivity and specificity to replace lymph node dissection. And while sentinel lymph node biopsy is increasingly becoming the standard of care, it is only able to diagnose the first draining lymph node. And thus, we believe that a new method to diagnose lymph node metastases in these patients is required. So our lab developed the porphosome. It's a 100 nanometer self-assembling porphyrin-based nanoparticle created out of a porphyrin lipid monomer known as pyrolipid. This, uh, the, due to the, the uh, aromatic structure of the porphyrin ring, these nanoparticles have unique multifunctionality with respect to cancer imaging and therapeutics. After intravenous administrations, porphosome has been shown to accumulate preferentially in, in tumors and metastatic lymph nodes in multiple animal models. After accumulating in the tumor based on the enhanced permeability and retention effect, the porphosomes disassemble into their, inherent, into their pyrolipid monomers. This releases their inherent porphosome fluorescence and allows for real-time intraoperative fluorescence-guided dissection and imaging in the time of cancer surgery. So we thought that we could harness this unique multifunctionality of the porphosome and apply it to the clinical problem of lymphadenectomy and endometrial cancer. What we hypothesized is that using the porphosome, we could improve our preoperative diagnosis of lymph node metastases. This would allow us to target our surgical interventions, which would decrease our surgical morbidity by preventing a lymphadenectomy in patients that did not require it. This may also improve the number of patients that receive adjuvant therapy in that low-risk patients who may not have had their lymph node metastases identified could go on to get important adjuvant therapy. Finally, by using this as an intraoperative tool, we could improve our intraoperative tumor resection, which may overall help us to improve our patient outcomes. To test our hypothesis, we created a model of endometrial cancer in white New Zealand rabbits by injecting VX2 tumor, either in vivo propagated or cultured, cell, or cultured uh, cells, which we made in our lab, into the uterine myometrium. At 30 days, 17 rabbits had developed a primary tumor, retroperitoneal lymph node metastases, and in some cases, cases intra-abdominal metastatic disease. We decided to go with a rabbit model because of the many benefits, as you can see here, large uteri and easy surgical model, but also their significant lymphatic similarities to humans, genetic and immunological similarities to humans. Furthermore, our VX2 cell line is noted to create reliable retroperitoneal lymph nodes, and it is a highly vascular tumor that resembles an endometrial adenocarcinoma in histology. Our cultured cell model, which we created, was thought to potentially better represent human endometrial cancer as it had a slower growth, less extensive lymph node metastases, and less intratumoral necrosis. So we then took our rabbits and we separated them into two dosing groups, a four milligram per kilogram high dose group and a, low, a one milligram per kilogram low dose group. Included in these groups were also sham and healthy control rabbits. All rabbits at 24 hours then underwent a standard porphyrin fluorescence guided surgical protocol. What this included was performing an initial complete white light and fluorescence inspection of the abdomen. After complete inspection, we then underwent image-guided fluorescent surgery of all intra-abdominal nodules, tumor, and retro, uh, retroperitoneal lymph node metastases. These tissues would represent either our true positive tissues or potentially our false positive tissues as they were fluorescent. After complete resection, we then did another full inspection of the abdomen under white light. This was to identify any suspicious tissue that was not fluorescent, which may represent a false negative tissue, and any, any identified tissue was also resected. Finally, after ensuring that all remaining tissue was fluorescence negative, we then did complete pelvic and periodic lymphadenectomies and performed six random peritoneal biopsies in the abdomen to help us identify true negative tissues, including true negative lymph nodes, as well as any potential false negative tissues. All tissues were then confirmed with ex vivo fluorescence using a maestro imaging machine and correlated with histopathology as well as fluorescence microscopy. 
We identified 17 primary tumors, 54 metastatic intra-abdominal nodules, and 81 metastatic lymph nodes. All of these tissues then underwent initial histopathological examination using a frozen section analysis. If the tissues were negative on frozen section, they then underwent an ultra-staging protocol, similar to which is done for human endometrial cancer, in which the tissues were serially sectioned, stained with immunostaining and H&E. Um, this ultra-staging protocol allowed us to identify 40% of all of our metastatic lymph nodes and 30% of all of our intra-abdominal metastatic disease, suggesting that the fluorescence signal that we were identifying at the time of surgery was related to porphosome accumulation and micrometastatic disease, as you can see in this picture. I don't know how I start the videos. So we then took videos of all of our uh, surgical, um, all of our surgical surgeries on our rabbits to, to demonstrate these real-time surgical applications of porphyrin fluorescence surgery. You can see in the first, how do I start the videos? In the first surgery, what you can see is that three weeks after tumor inoculation, the uterine tumor has no inherent in vivo fluorescence. However, you will see that after porphosome uh, administration at the time of the experiment, the uterine tumor is clearly visible against the background of the uterus, in addition to a small metastatic deposit laterally. In the next video, what you can see is that there are clearly identified left pelvic lymph nodes against the background of the retroperitoneum. These can be resected under image guidance. And what's more important is that accurate margin resection be, can be completed as tissue that appears normal on white light imaging was found to be fluorescent at the time of uh, the use of our fluorescence camera and could then be accurately resected. Uh, what's also important is that all of the tissue that you see here that's fluorescent in our videos was correlated with our ex vivo fluorescence and found to contain VX2 tumor. In our next video, what's also interesting about our porphosome technology is that it's intravenously administered, so you can also identify distant metastatic disease. In, the next, uh, in this video, what you'll see is that small omental metastases, about two to three millimeters in size, are clearly visible against the background of the omental tissue. This is significantly different to what we have now, as it allows us to identify disease that is spread throughout the abdomen. And finally, last but not least, we have also have one video of a lung meta metastases, which was in one of our rabbits. And you can also see that the tumor is clearly visible as white lesions against the background of the normal lung. And again, in both of these videos, all of the fluorescent tissue that you see did contain VX2 tumor. What we then wanted to do is to analyze all of our surgical videos to determine the fluorescent signal to background ratio, which is a marker of the intensity of our fluorescent signal. What you'll see is that in all of the true positive tissues, so our fluorescent VX2 positive tissues seen in blue, were significantly brighter than all of our false positive tissues, which were our fluorescent VX2 negative tissue, suggesting that with a little bit of further investigation, we may be able to identify a way of providing clear in vivo discrimination between true and false positive tissues. We then wanted to determine if these differences in fluorescence signal were in fact due to a difference in our porphosome accumulation in our tissues of interest. So what we did was we performed porphosome biodistribution studies using copper 64 labeled porphosomes and gamma counting. What we also saw was that the true positive tissues, again seen in blue, had a significantly higher accumulation of our nanoparticle than the false positive tissues seen in orange and the true negative tissues seen in gray. So this also suggests that these differences in fluorescence are in fact due to a difference in accumulation of our nanoparticle in our tumor bearing tissue. Lastly, we wanted to correlate our findings of our biodistribution with what's actually happening in our tissues of interest. So we performed fluorescence microscopy on all of our tissue samples. And what we found is that our porphyrin signal seen here in red correlates exactly with the areas of tumor on H&E staining and pan keratin staining, suggesting it's not a random accumulation of the nanoparticle in these tissues, but is in fact an intratumoral accumulation. Lastly, what we did was we wanted to determine the sensitivity and specificity for porphyrin fluorescence guided surgery in our endometrial cancer model. We did this by comparing the number of true positive, false positive, true negative, and false negative results based on our histologic analysis. What we found overall is that we identified 60 true positive lymph nodes, 16 false positive lymph nodes, and 30 true negative lymph nodes from our remaining lymphadenectomy specimens. There were no false negative lymph nodes detected. 
And in terms of our intra-abdominal disease, there was 45 true positive metastases, five false positive metastases, and 53 true negative biopsies. We also identified two false negative biopsies. Overall, as well, there were 17 true negative uterine tumors with no false positive or false negative uterine tumors identified. This overall gave us an extremely high sensitivity for our profiron fluorescence guided surgery with up to 100% for the detection of lymph node metastases in our model and 98% overall. It was also high in abdominal metastases at approximately 96%, suggesting that this technology and our model was able to, able to accurately diagnose all of the tumor that we were able to find on our histologic analysis. Looking at our specificity, we saw that the specificity also remained high at 80% overall and was 92% in our abdominal metastatic disease. It was somewhat lower in our lymph nodes at 65%. However, we did find that this change with respect to the dose of porphosome administered and our model type with our highest specificity noted in the cultured cell model at 74%. So overall, we found that porphosomes are a highly sensitive imaging agent for the detection of uterine tumor, intra-abdominal metastatic disease, and lymph node metastases in our model of endometrial cancer. We found the specificity was extremely high for tumor and abdominal metastatic disease, and the specificity for lymph node metastases was somewhat dependent on the porphosome dose, as well as our VX2 model. However, we do believe that we could continue to improve this by using tumor targeting, which would help us to more accurately target our porphosome to our tumor tissues of interest. Our future directions in the lab is that we are attempting to get Health Canada approval for first in human clinical trials in endometrial cancer. And we believe that this technology or technologies like this may be a useful modality in the future for targeting our lymph node dissections and may be especially useful for the identification of primary tumor and abdominal metastases and other types of tumors that spread throughout the abdomen. So I would like to thank everybody. This was my master's research, Dr. Bernardini, my supervisor, as well as everybody that helped me. And I will now take questions. Thanks. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. This is pretty cool. Um, kind of feel like you're in the future. <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering, what are these porphosomes like to work with in terms of as you're dissecting around the tissue, do they spill and then contaminate the area beside? Um, no, so that's one definite plus as compared to ICG because they are intravenously administered as opposed to interstitially administered. They, oh, I didn't find at the time of surgery that they were causing that sort of smear spread that you may get when you're using ICG. So that was definitely one benefit. And in, in terms of using them in the preclinical setting, they're also very easy. They just need to be refrigerated. They're intravenously administered like any intravenous injection 24 hours prior to surgery. Um, so I believe once you, know, you cross the hurdles of Health Canada approval, they would be easily able to be used in a clinical setting. And, and do you foresee, I don't know if you could, if what you look for in the rabbits, but do you see any potential complications that could, um, could be seen in humans, or did you have any issues with their usage? Um, the one complication that has been noted is that, and this is seen across um, lipid-based nanoparticle platforms, is that they do sometimes cause a slight hypersensitivity type reaction when they're injected due to the lipid content of the, of the nanoparticle. So the, um, they are doing some studies in dogs and they have been pre-treating them similarly to how you would pre-treat people prior to chemotherapy with steroids and, and antihistamines, which has basically completely solved that problem. As well, um, they are doing toxicity studies at this time, but there are, they have done studies in our lab with vast larger than therapeutic injection volumes, and there hasn't been any noted toxicity in any of the animals. They are completely biodegradable. They degrade down into porphyrin, which is similar structure to hemoglobin, which is your body has a way of getting rid of that on its own, and then a lipid side chain, which is also very biological. Um, so DVT prophylaxis is one of the most important orders that we routinely write after surgery. And that is because most of thromboembolic events are preventable. 
DVTs, or deep vein thrombosis, and PEs, or pulmonary emboli, are the second most common cause of mortality in cancer patients. In fact, um, getting a postoperative PE will more than double the risk of postoperative mortality for ovarian cancer patients. So thank you for this opportunity to share with you today the impact of dual mechanical and pharmacological thromboprophylaxis on patients undergoing laparotomies for gynecologic malignancies. So prior to our intervention, one in 20 patients experienced a symptomatic PE. I'll share with you today how the Division of Gynecologic Oncology at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center achieved a 0% PE rate for 11 months in the study duration, and now for a total of 17 months. So DVTs are very common in our population. Five to 15% of postoperative post patients will develop symptomatic DVTs or PEs. They impact patients significantly. It will delay adjuvant treatment, uh, require chronic anticoagulation, and up to a third of patients will develop chronic post-thrombotic syndrome, which is characterized by uh, intractable pain and debilitating edema. Importantly, it more than doubles the risk of postoperative mortality. Several risk factors will interact uh, to increase the risk of a, patient, uh, a patient's risk of uh, thromboemboli. These include patient-related and procedure-related risk factors, and our field is a unique challenge as these risk factors are very common. Importantly, most of these thrombi will develop during surgery or within 24 hours. There is no consensus in our field on the op optimal protocol for thromboprophylaxis. Um, some of the guidelines are based on retrospective evidence, and thankfully we have the American College of Chest Physician guidelines, which actually indicate that most of our patients will meet criteria for high risk. So, so these patients who, have, uh, who meet the high-risk criteria should be getting dual thromboprophylaxis. Mechanical thromboprophylaxis will act on two of the three um, components of Virchow's triad. Um, so mechanical thromboprophylaxis decreases venous stasis and decreases tears in venous walls and also improves endogenous fibrinolysis. They are associated with a threefold decrease in uh, DVTs in several randomized controlled trials. These need to be applied prior to surgery, and patients should keep them throughout their admission, as most DVTs will develop throughout, um, within the 24 hours of surgery. Pharmacological thromboprophylaxis uh, uh, acts by decreasing hypercoagulability, and there are several advantages of low molecular weight heparin over unfractionated heparin. So these two methods work synergistically and are advocated by the American College of Chest Physicians for high-risk patients. There's also evidence for extended pharmacological thromboprophylaxis, and 40% of DVTs are actually diagnosed after hospital discharge at a median of 14 days. So the guidelines uh, recommend that all ca cancer patients undergoing surgery should be getting extended thromboprophylaxis. So our intervention was threefold. Prior to our intervention, patients received low molecular weight heparin after surgery throughout their admission, and patients who are deemed to be high risk receive extended thromboprophylaxis. After our intervention, they received a combination of mechanical thromboprophylaxis with sequential compression devices that were applied prior to surgery, and they had to wear them throughout their admission, uh, in addition to low molecular weight heparin uh, throughout the admission, and patients who had a confirmed malignancy received a total of 28 days of um, enoxaparin. So this was implemented in December 2017. Our primary goal was to evaluate the rates of pulmonary emboli, the symptomatic PEs, within 30 days of surgery. Secondary outcomes included rates of DVTs as well as risk factors for PEs. We also tracked adverse outcomes and balancing measures to ensure no unintended consequences. We conducted a prospective uh, study in, uh, using our institutional Nesquip database. This ensures validated and reliable data collection. We supplemented this with chart review to obtain more demographic and surgical details. Um, we included all laparotomies confirmed, uh, sorry, uh, performed by gynecologic oncology surgeons, um, excluding um, emergency surgeries, as well as patients who had an active DVT or PE. We conducted a power analysis and calculated that uh, to have a 90% power to detect a 20% difference in rates of symptomatic PEs, we needed 74 patients in both arms. 
So these are our results. We had a cohort of 534 patients, 371 underwent surgery prior to our intervention, and 163 after implementation. So you'll see that in both groups, um, age, body mass index, comorbidities such as diabetes and smoking were similar. The proportion of patients who had a confirmed malignancy and advanced stage was also comparable in both groups. In terms of operative characteristics, blood loss, operative time, and length of stay was similar in both groups, and there were less cytoreductive surgeries in the post-intervention cohort. And now for results. So you will see that our intervention was very successful. We decreased the rates of PE from 5.1% to 0%. The study duration was 11 months, and this has been sustained now for 17 months. The rates of DVTs um, were comparable in both groups with no statistically significant change. However, with more chart review, we um, found that the ordering of Doppler ultrasound of the legs after a diagnosis of symptomatic PE was not consistent, so this may not be the most reliable measure. We then conducted univariate analysis to identify risk factors for PEs, and this identified that having surgery prior to the, prior to the intervention a longer length of stay and increased estimated blood loss were risk factors for PEs. And then we performed a multivariable analysis based on what was found to be significant on univariate anal analysis. And we found that having had surgery prior to the intervention was an independent predictor for risk of PE. We also aim to track balancing measures. So we looked at rates of transfusions, symptomatic hematomas, and reoperations for bleeding, and there is no increase in the post-intervention cohort. So strengths of our study include that this was a prospective uh, data collection. We also used only Nesquip cases, which ensures reliable data collection. And our tools are easy to implement and generalizable to complex patients and complex gynecological procedures. Limitations of our study include that while the bundled um, intervention is effective at addressing a multifactorial ideology of thromboemboli, it doesn't allow us to pinpoint which um, measures were more effective. And then future area for study will include to evaluate the cost effectiveness as well as the adherence to each bundle component. In addition, uh, we were limited uh, in assessing the rates of DVTs uh, because of the inconsistent ordering of ultrasounds, and then these outcomes are only within 30 days. So in conclusion, um, our intervention was very effective. We decreased the rates of PE by uh, from 5% to 0%. It's been sustainable, and it could be tailored uh, for patients with comorbidities and other surgical subspecialties. So I would like to thank uh, the gynecologic oncology surgeons at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center in Toronto, um, and in uh, particular, Dr. Danielle Vikas for her guidance and mentorship in this project. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your questions and feedback. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> questions? Um, just wondering, um, at Sunnybrook, are there other um, divisions that um, that have worked with you and adopted a similar kind of thing, high-risk uh, colorectal surgery, that kind of thing? Uh, I'm not aware of it, no. No. So I'll start by um, saying that we really identified this through NISQIP data. So we were identified as outliers in comparison to other G1 oncology centers, but also within our own center. We had the highest level. Now that we've gotten our rates down from 5% to 0%, or it's never going to be zero, it's NISQIP data, so it's not all cases. Um, they're looking at other services that may not have as high of a rate, but have higher rates, mm -hmm. and they're looking at implementing something pretty similar to this. Yeah, excellent.